Hello everybody and welcome. This is History Dude and today we will be continuing our series on military history talking about ancient Rome and this is a video I've been looking forward to for a while and it's taken me quite a while to put it together but I believe it is totally worth it as you will soon see. <clears throat> now I put up together a brief timeline um, of all the important things of Roman military history. From 264 to 146 BCE you have the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage and in 146 BCE work begins on the Via Ignatia a road that enabled the Roman armies to access most of the Balkans from Italy so now you can start to see some Roman engineering work 134 to 133 BCE, Scipio Africanus besieges the Celt Iberian stronghold of Numantia, surrounding it with circumvallations and siege towers. Again, a sign <coughs> of Roman engineering. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Ooh, I had something stuck in my throat. All right. 102 BCE, Roman general Marius defeats the Teutones in the Battle of Acqui marking the reformed Roman army's first successes. So, as you can see, this is after the Roman army has been reformed, and we're going to be getting into all of this in much more detail. This is just a brief timeline to kind of give you an idea of how things fit together. 58 to 50 BCE, Julius Caesar conquers Gaul, defeating Vercingetorix at the Siege of Alesia. Roman engineers build complex siege works, preventing relief forces coming to the defender's aid. And we'll be talking about that as well. 27 BCE, Augustus becomes the first Roman emperor, reduces the number of legions from around 60 to 28. In 73, Flavius Silva uses his engineers of the 10th legion to subdue the mountain fort of Masada in Palestine. In 101 to 106, Emperor Trajan defeats the Dacian king during the Dacian Wars, making Dacia an outpost of the Roman Empire which was the high watermark of the Roman Empire. 122 to 124, Hadrian's Wall becomes the Romans' most complex border system. 378, Gothic barbarians defeat the main field army of the Eastern Empire at the Battle of Adrianople. Emperor Valens falls in battle, marking Rome's worst military disaster for nearly 400 years. And finally, in 476, Romulus, the last of the Roman emperors in the West, was overthrown by the Germanic leader Odoacer, marking the end of the Western Roman Empire. <clears throat> okay, and here's a map of the extent of the Roman Empire. As you can see, they held a massive amount of territory. They held all North Africa, the Levant, all of Asia Minor, you know, Gaul, Iberia, Britannia, they went far. The Romans have one of the greatest empires of all time. And this is the reason I wanted to make such an in-depth video about them, because the Romans, well, they weren't as big as the Mongols, but they were more important than the Mongols, because they left behind a better legacy, and they taught us more about things in general, you know, I mean, the Romans are the ones who gave us concrete, they're the ones who gave us domes in architecture, so we owe it a lot to the Romans, and the Roman road system, obviously, but we're going to be getting into all this in much more detail. Okay, now, for the Roman military, now, the early legions had three categories of heavy infantry, the Hastati, who were the least experienced, the Principes, the best quality troops, and the Triarii, the veterans. The Hestadi and the Principes were armed with heavy javelins, known as Pila, whereas the Triarii, or Triarii, I'm going to call it Triarii, the Triarii had thrusting spears, Hastai, as they were known. Now the legionaries were protected by bronze helmets and semi-cylindrical body shields, and from the mid-3rd century BCE, they were armed with a short sword, the Gladius Hispanensis. And that we'll be talking about as well. I have some photos to show you. Um, and 
you will get to see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, in the early days of the Roman Empire, um, they were drawn up into three lines, and each divided into ten maniples units of around 150 men. Now, the legions fought in much the same way as many ancient armies. The supporting cavalry, the equites, and the light infantry, the velites, would attempt to turn the enemy flank while the heavy infantry tried to breach their opponent's line. Few armies could match the Romans in number or skill, but the legions suffered major setbacks when faced with the tactical genius of the Carthaginian general Hannibal during the Second Punic War. And here, I have decided to include a brief map of the Battle of the Trebia, which occurred during the Punic Wars. Now, now here you can see the Romans in red and the Carthaginians in blue. And what they did was the Carthaginians' cavalry pushed back the Roman cavalry, and they had extra cavalry hidden under Mago, I believe, and he hit the Roman rear. That's what you see these little blue lines. That's what that is. So they were totally surrounded, and this is just one example of Hannibal's genius and military skill, and many, 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 many people died. Now, the reason I decided to show the Battle of the Trebia versus, you know, say, Cannae or Lake Trasimene was because, just to illustrate Hannibal's genius. You know, obviously Cannae is the more, um, how you should say, famous battle, but I like focusing on battles that m many people know about, which is why I picked the Battle of the Trebia. So, just things like that that I like illustrating in my videos. Now here's a depiction of the Battle of the Trebia. As you can see it was major chaos. The Carthaginians just completely surrounded and destroyed the Roman force and it did not lead to good morale back home. Now, the Marian reforms. Although the Roman army ultimately won the Second Punic War, its performance struggled during the second century BCE and it was lackluster and they struggled in wars against the Numantines in Spain and against Jugurtha, the king of Numidia in North Africa. And from 107 BCE, the Roman general Marius instituted a number of reforms. Now, among them, the army became a permanent force, not recruited fresh each campaigning season. It became open to all rather than only the propertied classes. There was now just one form of heavy infantry issued with the standardized equipment, the pilum, the gladius, male armor, and the scutum, a long rectangular shield. A more flexible tactical subunit, the cohort, also came into use. This consisted of 480 men divided into six centuries, a unit of 80 men. Now, the standardized military equipment made it so, you know, you could mass produce equipment, you know, you didn't have to custom make it for each soldier anymore. Well, I'm sure they had to for the armor, but I mean, they had the, everyone had the same sword, everyone had the same shield, you know, so it made things much easier and it helped to make the Roman army even stronger than it was before. As you can see, before the Roman, uh, before the Marian reforms, everyone kind of had their own thing. He has his own shield, he has his own shield, he has his own shield. And they have different weapons that they just kind of put together, different armor. After the Marian reforms, everyone looks like this. Everyone looks like the same soldier. And that is what changed the Roman Empire. Now, just to go over some of the equipment that the Romans used. Here you can see a scutum. Now the scutum was a long rectangle that curved inward to form a part cylinder, giving greater protection to its wearer. Now, as depicted um, here, it is adorned with legionary insignia, as you can see right here. Now, when in not in, when in not in use, it was protected by a leather cover. So this was the main shield. 
of the Roman foot soldier. Now, the Lorica Segmentata was made up of overlapping iron plates with leather straps running underneath. It had origins in gladiatorial equipment, and although providing good pr protection, the complicated fittings made it hard to maintain. But it did provide great protection in the field. Now, the Pelum over here uh, was the throwing weapon designed so that its pointed head would break off on hitting the target, making it impossible to hurl back. And that's pretty much what you want out of a javelin. You don't want to throw it at the troops, only to have them pick it up and throw it right back at you. But that's where the Roman military genius comes in. They made the tip so that if it hit an enemy's shield, it would break off and it would be stuck in their shield and they couldn't get it out. So it would weigh it down so they'd have to throw it away, giving, you know, throwing away half their protection. So. It's it's the little details like this that make the Roman Empire and the Roman army in general as great as it was because they took things down to the tiniest of the details and they made it work. Now the Gladius Hispaniensis was um, well, it was Iberian in origin. It came from Spain, and it was a thrusting weapon. You didn't slash with the gladius, his, like, you didn't slash with it. It was a stabbing weapon. Um, soldiers would have their scutum in one hand, their gladius in the other, and they would push forward and stab, and push forward and stab, and they would rinse and repeat. And that is pretty much how the Roman army fought. Now here you can see the depictions of different, how you should say, um, different organizations in the Roman army. And, oh, hold on a second. The Roman army was divided into different units. They had Century and they had Contubernium and they had all this. But I think this little video here can explain it better than I ever could. There are two main types of soldier. A legionary is a Roman citizen. An auxiliary is not. Each must supply his own equipment and swear an oath of loyalty to the Emperor. Legionaries join an infantry unit as part of a group of eight men, a contubernium, who all share sleeping quarters. New soldiers are stuck with fatigues, dirty jobs, until they secure a specialist post. Ten contubernia form a century, with its own standard bearer, commander of the watch, second in command, and a centurion, to lead them all. Six centuries together make up a cohort. And ten cohorts, plus a small cavalry unit, the Equites Legionis, make up the biggest Roman army unit of them all, the Legion. The Legion's symbol is the Roman Eagle, borne aloft by the Aquilifer. Cohorts in a Legion are numbered one to ten. Cohort one is extra large, with five double centuries. Its centurions are the senior ranking primi ordines, and the most senior of all is primus pilus, or first file. He can be promoted to be prefectus castrorum, camp prefect, in charge of the daily running of the legion. Outranking this camp prefect are seven men, six staff officers, the tribuni, and the commander of the entire legion, the legatus. Back in Rome, he's a member of the Senate, the Empire's 600-strong ruling elite. But in the field, he commands his legion of some 6,000 troops, each a Roman citizen. But while these citizen legionaries are the backbone of the Roman army, the non-Roman citizens, the auxiliaries, are the specialists. In auxiliary cohorts, men recruited across the Empire use their talents and abilities in the service of Rome. 
One area of expertise was horsemanship. There are cavalry-only regiments, the Allah. A few double-strength cavalry regiments, including one in Britain, the Alla Petriana. Also part-mounted cohorts. And some auxiliary cohorts are just regular infantry, organized like the legionary cohorts. But the similarities stop here, at the cohort. Auxiliaries are part of no bigger unit. There's no legion and no legate to command them. Instead, each cohort has its own high-ranking commander, who leads these more compact, maneuverable units. And when an auxiliary soldier has served the Roman army for 25 years, a great reward awaits. He gets a plot of land, a pension, and all of the rights of a Roman citizen, for him, his children, and the generations to come. Okay, so as you can see by that video, the Romans were incredible at organizing their armies. They had military units, subunits, and they let their officers um, do their own thing, which is extremely important. You know, the whole reason Hitler lost World War II was his micromanaging. He always had to be had this or that or this or that you know and you can't do that if you're going to be running a military force you're going to have to let your subordinates do their job and doing their job involves let, letting them make their own decisions and that's why the roman army was as powerful as it was now briefly let's talk about some roman camps now the roman camps um they were pretty, pretty advanced. And, um, let's see. You have to understand, every single Roman legionary was practically an engineer because they all carried entrenching tools. And every single night, they would make a camp. Maybe not a camp. As advanced as this but they would set up camp now uh, sited on level ground the camps were usually rectangular surrounded by a v-shaped ditch and an earth rampart bristling with wooden spikes that the legionaries carried with them now once the area was conquered more permanent forts were built um, based on this so-called playing card design because they had rounded corners. See the round corner right here? Um, each fort had four main gates, one of which, the Porta Praetoria, faced enemy territory, a network of roads, a central block of buildings that contained the Praetorium, which was the commander's house, and the Principia, which was the headquarters, Principia, and a shrine for legionary standards. Now, forts were built in various sizes to accommodate either whole legions or smaller auxiliary cohorts, around 500 men. Now, they sometimes formed part of complex linear defenses or even walls, such as Hadrian's Wall in Britain. Over time, the earth and turf of many of the original forts were replaced with stone, and during the later empire, the walls were stronger and had projecting corner towers, allowing for missile crossfire. These developments reflected the fact that the forts had become places that the army needed to defend rather than bases from which to dominate the surrounding territory. And that just goes to show that the Roman army was on the decline at this point when these forts stopped being used to control the enemy territory and they switched into a defensive role. Now the late Roman army was an army completely different than the regular Roman army. They did not have the same equipment. They, the scutum was gone. They replaced it with this oval shield, as you can see here. And they had different armor. The helmets changed. Um, this was the period where the Roman army, or the Romans, had converted to Christianity. And 
this is why you can see the Cairo symbol on their shields because they had switched to Christianity. This is the army. This is the Roman army that you picture under Emperor Constantine and the like. Another feature of the Roman army was cataphracts in the late Roman army. Yes, the Romans did have cataphracts. And here is an image of some of those cataphracts. And auxiliary forces also became played a much bigger role than they did in ancient Rome. In the newer Roman army, auxiliary forces became much more reliant. They became much more reliant on auxiliary forces. And this would prove to be their downfall because as they relied more heavily and heavily on foreign troops, those foreign troops stopped, you know, having allegiances to Rome and they started rebelling and, you know, the next thing you know, well, look up the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, you know, I think that speaks for itself. Auxiliary forces, while it wasn't the entire reason the Roman Empire fell into decay, it was a big, big part of it. Now, Hadrian's Wall. Now, in, let's see, between 76 to 138 AD, the Emperor Hadrian decided that he needed to build a wall in northern Britain to stop the, on, or the onslaught of the uh, Celts. So what he did was he built a wall, and he built it just like this, and it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You can go see it still today. It still stands. It's not as magnificent as it was, you know, 2,000 years ago, but it still stands, and it just, it's a testament to Roman engineering. Because the Roman soldier was not just a soldier. He was an engineer. He made roads. He built forts. He built walls. They were builders as well as soldiers. And if you're going to be studying the Roman army, that is a big thing to know about. Now, here you can see a Roman fort. Now, this is the one where a more permanent fort was built. These aren't the temporary forts you saw before with the wooden ones. These are the ones with stone walls on it. It shows you there's the Principa, there's the Praetorium, there's the barracks, you have a granary for food, you have the V-shaped moat around it, the Porta Praetoria which faces the enemy, and this is how the forts were. They were rectangular, and they were efficient and they could house anywhere between 500 men to a whole cohort and here you can see the fort of Arbia now let's see on campaign a legion made a wooden camp surrounded by earth rampart as I told you before. Now, permanent forests were initially also made of wood and earth, but later ones, like this one in northeast England, were stone built. Used as barracks, administrative centers, and supply depots, they maintained a military presence in potentially hostile territory. Now, outposts of Roman civilization, the forests made no concessions to local climates or cultures, displaying similar features across the empire. Living conditions were basic and cramped. Units of eight soldiers called Contabernia shared small two-room suites in the barracks, but they did have heated bathhouses and latrines cleaned by running water, so hygiene standards were relatively high. So even though, you know, it was a fort in the middle of nowhere, it was a pretty classy fort. Uh, now this fort was a small one, housing about 600 auxiliary troops, both infantry and cavalry, it was built in the 2nd century CE, and it was a major supply center for the troops on Hadrian's Wall to the north. Now, 
the thing about the main entertainment room and some of the rooms is that, uh, like, for example, the commander's bedrooms were large and decorated by um, frescoes and stuff on the walls, as you can see here, they have some decorations. But they also were warmed by the hypocost, which was underfloor heating. Now, can you imagine? They had heated floors, ancient Rome, in their forts. A fort all the way up in northeast England had heated floors. And they had bathhouse latrines with high quality plumbing and running water. Now, for ancient Rome, that is pretty legit. Now, Roman sieges. Romans were great at building siege works. As you can see, they had the gallery, they had the catapult, they had ballista, which was their main weapon that they're most known for. Um, giant torsion operated machines that shot lead tipped bolts. As you can see here, they're like kind of like big crossbows. You had onagers, you know, testudo, they had built ramps and towers. Roman siege craft was very, very advanced. Now, as you can see here, this is the emblem of the 20th Legion, which took part in suppressing the Iceni Revolt in Britain. And the most important thing to understand about Roman sieges was the legionnaires put their skill at constructing fortifications and ramparts to good offensive effect in siege warfare, as they encountered enemy bastions like in Gaul and Britain and the elaborate walled towns of Judea. If an enemy fort could not be overtaken by stealth, it had to be surrounded and starved out, or, as a last result, resort, stormed. Now, to isolate an enemy position, the Romans built complex siege works of ramparts, often with towers from which to fire heavy catapults. Um, at the Siege of Alicia, Julius Caesar oversaw the building of 55 miles of ramparts that hemmed in Gaulish chieftain Vercingetorix and cut off supplies. Now, the vast earthworks called assault ramps intimidated the besieged troops and provided the attackers with access to the walls for artillery points and formed a platform for a final assault. More than the surviving remains of their forts, the finest testament to the Roman skills in military engineering is arguably their vast network of roads, which they used to great effect. They can march from point A to point B and point B to point A. And a nice straight road. Now, let's see. Before we get into that though, here's a picture of the Siege of Alicia just to show you how intense Roman siege crafting was. Now, in the Siege of Alicia, they had the when Julius Caesar built two separate um what's the word for it? Two separate are you serious? Are you serious? I can't remember. Two separate er, fortifications there. You have the inner fortification, which hemmed in the Vercingetorix at Alicia, and then you have the outside fortification, which protected against the reinforcements coming to attack. So they were defending from the outside, and they were defending from the inside. And it was to this day, probably one of the greatest sieges of all time, just based on the massive undertaking that it was. Now, here, you can see the Siege of Masada. Now, to take possession of this fort, the last stronghold of the Jewish Revolt in 73, the Romans had to build a counter wall with towers and a gigantic assault ramp, which you can see here. Um, on which to mount a battering ram. Now the ramp was 738 feet long and up to 656 feet wide. And here's a picture of the Siege of Masada. As you can see they pushed their siege craft up the ramp and up to the walls. And finally the Roman conquest of Dacia. Now this was the high point of the Roman Empire. 
this is when they started to crumble. After this, it was all bad. But the Emperor Trajan would <laughs> go on to conquer it, and he did a good job of it. Now, on Trajan's column in Rome, they have a depiction of the troops leading, leaving a fortress to cross the Danube on a bridge of boats. So they used pontoon bridges to get across the Danube into Dacia to start their campaign. And they did a good job of it. They took Dacia, but they could not hold on to the territory. And here is another picture of the Roman conquest of Dacia with them displaying the severed heads of their victims. And finally, here for your viewing pleasure is the timeline once again so that you can look over everything that we've discussed in this video and I hope that I've been entertaining I've kind of been off topic I didn't have my coffee this morning but but I hope you will forgive everything that I've said and I hope I've been an entertaining teacher if there's anything that I can do, any um, tips you have for me or suggestions, please do not hesitate to comment in the description below. I will make note of that. And I'm always looking to improve my videos. So if you have any tips, please let me know. But okay, that has been it for this video. And I hope you stay tuned for the next one. Enjoy.